prepare yourself for the tragic expedition into the realm of bear attacks as we unravel the gripping stories of individuals who found themselves in the claws of danger. From the heart-pounding pursuit endured by hunter Chase Delwo to the tragic expedition of Timothy Treadwell, each tale offers a unique insight into the raw power and unpredictability of grizzlies. Prepare yourself for the tragedies among nature's most formidable predators, the bear. When Chase DeWello went out hunting for elk with his brother Shane, the last thing he expected to see in the fog-covered woods was a huge grizzly over three feet away from him. As soon as he took a few steps back, the startled and equally frightened animal gave him no chance. A horrified Chase froze, not knowing whether to scream, stay still, or run. The bear charged him head on. It knocked him down and immediately bit into his head. Even as the blood poured out, Chase used his hand like a wild man thrashing around to save further injury to his brain. The bear struck him again, grabbing his leg and tossing him like a rag doll. But suddenly, as his life flashed before his eyes, a distinct memory from his childhood was unlocked. A simple yet poignant piece of advice from his grandmother, a piece of advice that saved his life. On October 3rd, 2015, Chase and his brother Shane set off into the woods near Shoto, Montana. Their objective was to hunt for elk. Montana is known for its natural beauty and diverse flora and fauna. The natural landscape makes for adventurous hiking full of rivers, forests, marshes, and snow-covered mountains. It is no wonder Montana is rich in wildlife like the wolverine, broghorn elk, bobcat, and of course, the apex predator, the deadly grizzly bear. For years, 26-year-old Chase had been coming to Montana to hunt deer and elk. He was no rookie and neither was his 30-year-old brother Shane. Both men were experienced in crossbow hunting and had never faced a situation that would make them stay away. Chase loved hunting with a crossbow, the weapon of his choice. He also knew how to track animals and understood natural surroundings perfectly. Nature is wild and can be mental. If you respect it, nature will respect you back. This is why when your gut tells you not to go forward on a hunt or a hike, listen to it because it's nature's way of warning you not to push your luck. Chase would often take his wife Becca hunting. Fortunately, he didn't on this day, or else the results could have been far worse. It was October and peak elk hunting season. Finding the game would be easy. The two brothers knew every inch of this territory, but on that day, it was foggy and the weather was bad. The problem is that the temperature drops drastically in October, bringing with it the first snow of winter. Snow and fog makes things more challenging, Nevertheless, though, they were good hunters and knew everything there was to know about the big game. As soon as they approached the woods, the brothers decided to split off. They were in the area of Muddy Creek Drainage, which is about 20 miles northwest of Shoto, close to the southwest corner of the Blackleaf Wildlife Management Area. They finally spied an elk herd, so it was decided that Chase would walk up to the creek bed where he would drive the herd towards Shane, who would remain waiting at the bottom. Chase did so. He thought nothing of walking up to the foggy path. They knew the dangers of hunting. There could be bears anywhere, but Chase had never encountered one, which made him feel more confident. Recalling the incident, he said, about eight to 10 minutes in, I heard a bull bungle, so I quickened my pace. He walked deeper up the creek bed, and an arrow knocked into his bow, but he knew he should not get ready to shoot. Shane would do that. He approached cautiously, the wind was blowing 30 to 40 miles per hour with snow and rain and visibility was poor, making him nervous about not being able to see well. Suddenly, the unthinkable happened. A humongous grizzly lay on the ground just three feet away from him. The beast looked to be easily 400 pounds. Chase froze in fear, wondering what he should do next. Chase wasn't carrying bear spray, nor had he followed experts' instructions like Mike Maddow. Maddow is a bear management specialist for Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. After the attack on Chase, Maddow says bow hunters do the opposite of what you're supposed to do when you come across a bear. It's pretty hard to hunt elk in the open, Maddow said. He explained how bow hunting often requires hunters to do exactly the opposite of what should be done to avoid surprising a bear. You need to wear camouflage, creep in thick cover, hike into the wind, and wear elk scent and urine. Chase had done none of these things. It was so windy that the bear had not noticed Chase walking towards it. As soon as it spied him, it was startled. 
And at that precise moment, the bear appeared scared, and scared animals are very dangerous. They either retreat or attack. The bear, after all, is the apex predator in these surroundings. And this was one grizzly who would certainly not run away. I had an arrow nooked, and I put my bow up in front of me and took two or three steps back, Chase said. There wasn't any time to draw my bow back. The bear gave Chase no chance to think. It charged him head on and knocked him clearly off his feet. When the animal found Chase on the ground, it dug its huge teeth into Chase's head. Chase felt a burning sensation in his head. It seemed as if an iron chain had just tightened around his brain. And that's obvious when a creature with a bite force of 1,160 PSI, almost twice that of a lion. The bear then let go of Chase, who described his ordeal saying he let go, but he was still on top of me, roaring the loudest roar I had ever heard. That's what grizzlies do best. They roar like the devil because that's their most intimidating action. And this one seemed to be telling Chase, how dare you interrupt my snooze. Soon after the first bite, it became a nightmare for Chase. Thinking the bear let him go was a mistake. He got up to run, but the bear charged him again as if wanting him to stay down. The bear chomped down on his leg and tossed him in the air. It was at that moment when Chase thought he was going to die. The grizzly seemed hell-bent on mauling him and ripping him to shreds. He came back and bit my lower right leg, gave it a pretty good shake and threw me sideways, Chase said. I remembered an article that my grandmother gave me a long time ago that said large animals have bad gag reflexes, Chase said. The bear attacked for a third time, but luckily it hadn't taken too many swipes at him. A bear with razor sharp claws would take just a few hard swipes to slit a human's throat open, but Chase was fighting. He could not give up. He had to work fast. He could see the enormous jaws wide open, bearing down on him again. That's when he summoned up all his strength and shoved his bleeding right arm down the bear's throat. The trick worked for a moment. The bear was too stunned and choking simultaneously. It quickly let go of his arm, pulled away, growled as if in pain, and turned and ran. At that moment, Chase heaved a sigh of relief. He just couldn't be more thankful for that moment. It was as if God had given him a new lease on life, and he began crying. Chase struggled to his feet, dazed and disoriented. He was bleeding profusely from his head. As he walked down the creek, hoping to find Shane, he saw a six-point elk on the way. That amused him, and he laughed. Chase was losing a lot of blood and began feeling faint. He had to stay conscious to find Shane. I forced myself to calm down and not to panic, he said. I was lost. I cleared the blood out of my eyes. If I had allowed myself to panic, I would still be there. He managed to make it out of the drainage and finally found Shane. When Chase spotted Shane, he began waving his bow wildly. Chase had been patiently waiting below the creek, oblivious to the terrifying drama unfolding just a few short distances away. He had heard growling, but never gave it much thought. They were in the forest after all. When he spotted Chase walking towards him, he thought Chase had shot an elk and was waving his hand joyfully. When Chase neared him, Shane was horrified to see his condition. Blood poured down his face. His body was almost unrecognizable, mangled and muddy. Seeing the blood on his body, Shane feared that Chase was injured severely in his abdomen. If that was true, he could die at any moment. Fortunately, that was not the case. Shane helped Chase into their vehicle and drove as fast as possible to reach Benefis Teton Medical Center in 20 minutes. On the way, he notified the staff waiting to receive Chase. The center was extremely lucky to have the necessary facilities to treat Chase's injuries. Chase suffered deep gashes on his head and required 100 stitches. He also needed stitches on his face and right leg, which were badly punctured. He had lacerations on his face and a swollen right eye, most probably from the force of the bear's paw or when he fell to the ground. Here was a man finally sitting in a hospital bed, a survivor attacked by a 400-pound grizzly who lived to tell the tale. When asked about his encounter in the hospital, Chase said, I want everyone to know that it wasn't the bear's fault. He was as scared as I was. Following Chase's attack, Officer Mike Maddow and a team decided to investigate the area, but failed to locate it for DNA samples to identify the animal. However, in the bear's defense, Maddow said that neither Shane nor Chase wanted the bear captured as it only acted out of instinct and had done nothing wrong. Maddow said both men had done the right thing, and what was important in the end was how they managed to get medical help from a pretty remote location. I'm just thankful he's going to be okay. 
In October 2003, air taxi pilot Willie Fulton landed his chopper at Katmai National Park to pick up air activist Timmy Treadwell and his girlfriend Amy. He was met with an eerie silence. Looking ahead, he was greeted with a terrifying sight that sent shivers down his spine. The beast's snarling maw, slick with fresh blood, was a haunting sight as it devoured what remained of Timothy. Strewn around the beast was Timothy's disfigured head, partial spine, right forearm, and hand with a wristwatch still on. Amy's remains were spread out near the tent. The bear did not just kill them, he made sure that he turned them into a gory buffet of a multi-course meal. How ironic that a man who dedicated his life to advocate protection for the bears would end up ripped apart by one of them. Even more dramatic in this grisly horror tale were the last moments of the couple recorded unknowingly on camera. Its footage, the source for an award-winning film Grizzly Man by Warner Herzog, never before has a live death been captured in such a bizarre, horrifying, and heartbreaking manner. But why? What went wrong? Let's unravel the tale of Timothy Treadwell. Timothy Treadwell was somehow pretty mixed up. Raised in Long Island, New York, he always wanted to be an actor. He even auditioned for Cheers, but Woody Harrelson beat him to it, and that drove him bonkers. He became an alcoholic and resorted to drugs. But you gotta hand it to the guy. He managed to step out of it sober and clean. Timothy found his new calling, the Wild Bears of Alaska. Every summer, he went camping in Katmai National Park, especially to an area called Kafila Bay along the Alaskan coast. It was a favorite haunt of bears, and Timothy named it the Bear Maze. It seems Timothy's former enthusiasm for extreme sports got the better of him. He was a guy doing his best Steve Irwin, Yahoo and like Robin Williams with bears who would wander up to him out of curiosity or perhaps they were just checking out the fair. Who knows? Several of Timothy's videos show him in a pseudo euphoria state, crazily wandering among bears, even touching one on the nose. For years, he began visiting and camping out near the bears. Despite being worn countless times, he felt he shared a rapport with these magnificent beasts. He loved them, but poor Mr. Timothy. They did love him back, only theirs was more of the yum-yum kind. Timothy broke every wildlife rule in the book. Animals rule. Timothy conquered. <laughs> Park service. Regularly bypassing forest rangers and rules that prohibited humans from coming within 100 feet of bears. He would often get up close to the bears and began recognizing each one and even gave them names like Mr. Chocolate and Sergeant Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chocolate. I'll see you again next year. Two in particular, named Demon and Machine, qualify for the concept of the 25th bear, an animal that will not tolerate another bear or human. But both bears didn't show much interest in the couple. Timothy's bear obsession reached to the point of him getting too close thinking he was gaining the respect of the animals. His opening statement in his videos became somewhat of a testimony to the foolishness of his self-styled mission. I'm a kind warrior. I would not die at their claws and paws. I would be a master. Warrior, yes, master, definitely not. As he would soon learn, perhaps in his final moments, as his heart gave way, as he was being torn to pieces. A classic example of Timothy's erratic behavior is one scene where he zooms in on a bumblebee on a flower, describing... Isn't this so sad? A bumblebee expired while I was doing the pollen thing. It's beautiful. It's sad. It's tragic. It's... Wait. The bee just moved. Is it... Is it just sleeping? Soon after, he goes on to film an ego match between two bears named Mickey and Sergeant Brown over a female, Saturn. Timothy's mission, he declared, was to create awareness about the bears. He even toured schools and gave video presentations to kids for free. In some of his rants, he claimed he was protecting bears from poachers and even federal authorities. In reality, the danger to the bears living in a protected national park was more of a figment of Timothy's imagination. If Treadmill believed he was such a staunch companion to the bears, how did he end up in the stomach of one of them? In Alaska, brown bears begin preparing for hibernation by September. That's when their appetites go crazy. It's also a time when bear enthusiasts, photographers, and watchers leave Katmai National Park because no one wants to end up a bear's breakfast. <laughs> Timothy, on the other hand, well, he felt he was immune to such issues and as usual prepared to make one of his trips to Katmai. His girlfriend Amy was reluctant as it was revealed by Timothy's tapes. 
In fact, in one instance, she even warned Timothy. It would be her last, having found a job in California. The couple spent considerable time in September camping in Kafila Bay. On September 26th, they packed up and left for the airport, but as fate would have it, Timothy suddenly had a change of heart. Something, he felt, wanted him back at Kafila. Perhaps it was the growling of the man-eater. Who knows? Timothy insisted that he just had to see one of his favorites, Downey, before it began raining. Now, this is deadly for Kafila Bay. Rain means more fish, and that means more bears. Using the excuse of increased airfare, Timothy decided to return. On the 29th, he once again sneaked back into the park, undetected by rangers. This time, Timothy set up camp in the most dangerous spot of the area he called the Maze. It was a spot right in the middle of the Bears Trail. He was unknowingly planning his own doom. It seemed he was hell-bent in encountering as many bears as possible. According to some bear experts, Timothy made sure his camp was in a spot near a lake where bears would have to pass as close to it as possible. Timothy was inviting trouble, yet it didn't bother him. No one felt that Timothy was ignorant of his situation. He knew exactly what he was doing. It was just out of sheer arrogance and stupidity that he was convinced that he was this amazing bear whisperer and no bear would ever harm him. With no support and defense to deter bears, Timothy and Amy were sitting ducks. On that ill-fated night of October 25th, the couple caught the attention of none other than the deadly machine. Machine was a huge grizzly who weighed at least 1,000 pounds. Instead of finding a way out, the obnoxious and foolhardy Timothy left Amy in the tent and like the host of some wildlife reality show, creeped up to the terrifying beast. But the predator and machine took over. How ironic that Timothy had captured each and every interaction with him and bears, and that included the gory and grisly details of his own death. It was air taxi pilot Willie Fulton who was supposed to pick up the couple on the 26th, but when he touched down, his heart sank. He knew exactly what must have happened. Yet nothing prepared Willie for the stomach-churning sight he was about to witness. It was a scene that would make every slasher flick look like a fairy tale. Machine was sitting on a pile of human remains picking off the leftover scraps, clinging to Timothy's ribcage. Fulton alerted Ranger Joe Elias, who also rushed to the scene. Near the couple's collapsed tent were the remains of Timothy's half-eaten head. It still remained on the end of a piece of spine, much like some voodoo stick. They found his right arm, and still had his wristwatch attached to it. Outside the tent still remained their snacks and shoes. Elias also spied a mound with an arm and fingers protruding from it. He assumed it was Amy's. While the entire surreal scene was still soaking in, the men found the ultimate high point in this horrifying carnage. Timothy's camera was still on, and it recorded the gut-wrenching ordeal. However, the camera lens had not been taking off. As a result, it was only the audio but the screams were bone-chilling. One hears Timothy shouting to a frightened Amy, Get out! I'm getting killed out here! Amy can then be heard unzipping the tent and rushing out shouting to Timothy to play dead. But as soon as she rushed to save Timothy, machine attacks, chomping down on Treadwheel's head. The bear drags Timothy into the bushes even as Amy can be heard screaming. Tim's voice is then heard shouting to Amy to hit the bear. Amy screams to Timothy to fight back while whacking the bear with a frying pan. Strangely though, throughout this massacre, the bear is silent and its growls aren't very pronounced. It was cool and methodically enjoying its meal. Timothy's screams soon die down to faint moans. Amy is then heard screaming, but her spine-chilling screams are abruptly cut off as the camera runs out. Machine the bear was captured soon after the incident and shot. A postmortem revealed four bags of human remains, suggesting that the aging bear had turned man-eater after struggling to feed. Had it not been for the camera, Timothy's story would never have been presented by Warner Herzog. So terrifying is the footage that Herzog ensured the camera was placed under lock and key so that no one could ever listen to it. Herzog did reveal, though, how Amy did not share Timothy's enthusiasm for bears and often said her boyfriend was hell-bent on destruction. Be warned. I will die for these animals. I will die for these animals. animals. In early December 1985, while walking through the woods of northern Georgia, a tired hunter came across a sight that made his blood freeze. It was a large, daunting black bear. His first thought 
was to panic and run, but there's no outrunning a bear. The bear was gigantic. One swipe from those powerful claws would result in his swift demise. The hunter gripped his rifle tight as hundreds of fear-driven thoughts raced through his mind. The dry leaves under his feet would have made it impossible for him to sneak away, and the bear would have hurt him for sure. Fortunately, there was a large rock near him, allowing him to inch his way behind it. A few minutes went by, and the sweat started streaming down his face in fear. As the hunter decided to peek around the rock, what he saw shocked him out of his wits. The bear was lying dead on the ground with a bag filled with cocaine right beside it. And so began the legend of the cocaine bear. The story begins a few days earlier, when Fred M. Myers of Knoxville, Tennessee, found a dead man in his driveway, sprawled out on an unopened parachute with blood trickling down from his nose. Little did Myers know that the dead man was none other than Andrew Carter Thornton, a man with a thrilling connection to the infamous story of the cocaine bear. Andrew Carter Thornton II was the son of a well-respected horse breeder from Kentucky. Born in 1944, Andrew distinguished himself in the U.S. Army. He became an expert paratrooper, winning a Purple Heart when the U.S. invaded the Dominican Republic in 1965. That same year, Thornton left the service and returned back to Kentucky, where he signed up to be a policeman and was posted to the Lexington Police Department's narcotic squad. Now, drugs are a damning thing. Like the devil, they tempt even the most sincere people. For Andrew, narcotics were a whole new ball game that could make him rich. Instead of cracking down on drugs, he became more interested in dealing with them. It seems Andrew got bored with being a cop. He wanted more thrills in life. He was an adventurer. And even if it meant doing illegal things, he wanted the excitement. He eventually resigned from the police department and became an attorney. And even as an attorney, Thornton got bored. The lure of narcotics and the tempting life he promoted was just the adrenaline rush he needed. He soon became a drug smuggler. Thornton's desire for a fast-paced, exciting, and dangerous life drove him deeper and deeper into the drug trade. However, the law soon caught up with him. When along with 24 others, he was indicted for piloting a plane smuggling marijuana from South America to Lexington, Kentucky. Thorne did not surrender so easily. It took a massive chase that lasted several months to track him down. He was finally caught and served five months in prison. He was also disbarred as an attorney. But once he was out, he resumed his narcotic smuggling once again. But one fine day in September of 1985, his drug-filled career was to come to an end. And what an end that turned out to be on September 10, 1985, Thornton was, as usual, piloting a Cessna over northern Georgia on one of his smuggling trips from South America to the U.S. His cargo was 900 pounds of cocaine. Like before, the feds were again hot on his trail, and Thornton got wind of it. He knew that the federal agents were tracking his plane and may also be following him. Thornton spoke to his co-pilot, saying that they were being tracked. He suggested they place the plane on autopilot and jump out with parachutes. He knew the plane would eventually crash if they jumped, giving him a chance to escape capture. Even though his co-pilot was nervous, Thorne knew there was no option. They had to jump. They strapped parachutes onto the nefarious cargo and then, one by one, pushed all the cocaine out of the plane. Thorne knew he would eventually find the bags when he landed. Thorne was a smart criminal, and criminals are cruel and cold-hearted. Even as his co-pilot struggled to put on his chute, Thorne pushed him out of the plane. Thorne then jumped after switching on autopilot. The plane's wreckage was found five hours later in a suburb of Knoxville, Tennessee. They say karma gets you eventually, and Thorne, despite a parachute, would not make it. The following morning at dawn, 85-year-old Frank Myers, an Alzheimer's patient, was getting ready to go out as part of his daily routine. As soon as he stepped out, Frank saw something odd in his driveway. He went up to what he thought was a large bag flying around. He was shocked to find an unopened parachute, and there, sprawled out on top of it, was a man, dead with blood oozing from his nose. It was Thornton. Up until the very end, Thornton was too greedy. He had strapped on too many bags of cocaine, which proved his undoing. The parachute probably got tangled or caught up in one of the bags and refused to deploy, sending Thornton crashing down to earth. Fred Myers found Thornton's body dressed in a bulletproof vest, camouflaged fatigues, and night vision goggles. He looked like some sort of special ops soldier, except for the Gucci loafer. Of course, a frightened Myers immediately called the police, 
who heeded his call. Thorne had dropped his 900-pound consignment in several duffel bags all across the Chattahoochee Natural Forest. An extensive search by authorities helped locate most of the bags except for one. That was found by the hero of our story, who sadly would end up being another victim of this sordid night of drug-filled crime a la Thornton. It was Pablo, the black bear, a common resident of the area. Pablo was strolling around in Chattahoochee Natural Forest on that cold winter evening in December 1985. The bear soon came across an unusual object lying in the grass. Bears are curious creatures by nature, and the bear wanted to investigate. After all, bears just love to eat, and maybe this was food. It was a duffel bag. The bear didn't know that it only needed to pull the zipper to get it open. It slashed the bag instead. It didn't find food, but instead, small batches of the powdery white substance. After ripping it open, the bear might have wondered, was it snow? Well, to be blunt, yeah, it was snow, but of a different sort. It was a bag containing 70 pounds of pure cocaine, and it belonged to Andrew Carter Thornton. It was one of the missing bags that the drug smuggler had dropped over the forest. As soon as Pablo slashed open the stash, the sweet scent of cocaine hit him. If there is one thing bears love, it is something sweet, which is why they go crazy over honey. Pablo then instantly began licking and sniffing the white powder. Even as the bear was consuming a lot, the drug was slowly working into its bloodstream, and within minutes, the coke hit poor Pablo with the full force of its intoxicating properties. The bear suddenly felt something he had never felt before. It was an adrenaline rush like no honeycomb could ever give him. He felt invigorated and began running as fast as he could. He did not know why he was running. He just needed to let off steam. It was at that precise moment when the hunter came across Pablo. The hunter, who was never identified, was terrified. Seeing a black bear is one thing, but one in a coked out frenzy is enough to make anyone wet their pants. The bear was acting like a maniac. It was on its hind legs, dancing around like crazy. Please, God, please, the hunter thought to himself. Don't let that bear see me, please. The bear looked huge and menacing. Black bears aren't usually aggressive, but that doesn't mean they won't attack you if they feel threatened. And a solitary human in front of a bear would stand no chance. The hunter looked for cover and hid behind a rock. He steadied his rifle, preparing to shoot, but then something told him to just wait. He later recalled that his immediate thoughts were to get out there as quickly and silently as possible. The bear was not far from him, so the hunter remained hidden and out of sight. He stayed put behind the rock, hoping the bear would leave. But suddenly, he noticed there were no sounds coming from the bear. Was it gone? He slowly raised his head and peered from over the rock, and what he saw baffled him. The bear's body laid motionless on the ground, slumped over in a weird position. The hunter summoned up some courage and made his way to the animal. He nudged it with his foot, and sure enough, the bear was dead. Without giving it much thought, the hunter returned home and narrated his story about Pablo to his friends. He even mentioned how he noticed a duffel bag in the forest and found it strange. By this time, the cops had already got wind of Thornton's plan after recovering his body. They put two and two together and realized Thornton had jettisoned his cargo over the forest. Upon hearing the hunter's story, the authorities then investigated the area, which is when they too found the body of poor Pablo the bear lying next to the torn duffel. An autopsy formed on the bear found the animal's stomach filled with cocaine, which confirmed that it died of a drug overdose. Rather than disposing of the body, though, the examiner had Pablo taxidermed. He then gifted it to the Chattahoochee River National Recreational Area, where it changed several hands over time. Some say Cocaine Bear, as it's now called, was even once owned by country music singer Waylon Jennings. Even though most of Thornton's cargo was recovered, no one knows how many more were affected by the cocaine lying scattered over the Chattahoochee Forest. But what do you think? Could the authorities have acted faster? Did the bear consume all the cocaine? Was the hunter telling the entire truth? We may never know, but make sure to check out the next video on the screen.